Okay, Rack, are you done letting people in? Do you want me to? I think so. Let's get started. Okay. All right. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm glad you all could come. This is very exciting. My name is Susan Pack. If you don't know me, I'm the president of the Ayurveda Association of Wisconsin. And um, I want to shout out to Yama Yoga. I hope there's a bunch of people there watching us. Um, so here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, we are finishing off Ayurveda week with a watch party at Yama Yoga, which is why I'm um, pointing to them or talking about them. And um, this is the culmination of a whole week of events. And now we're on National Ayurveda Day. And um, my first experience with Dr. Baswati Bhattacharya was when I studied with Divya Alter and she came and did, I can't remember if it was just a day or a weekend um, that was, she talked about food and I was just fascinated <laughs> with you. Um, and I just thought, oh my God, you're a guest speaker. And then I found out you were teaching a 10 week class on, um, I think it was called plant-based nutrition. That was really interesting. So um, I signed up for it. I learned just tons of stuff. And anyways, and then I went out and bought her book. And I think you can even get it. Um, it's autographed too. So this is just a really excellent read. If, um, if you don't have the book, you really should get it. And I just, um, when I talk about her to my friends, I, I say that she has more degrees than a thermometer, and maybe she'll tell you if we have time in an hour to go through all of her credentials. She's just amazing. So when Raka mentioned, well, let's get Dr. Bhattacharya, and I thought, nothing personal, Raka, I thought, oh my God, she's crazy. There's no way that Dr. Bhattacharya would come in and talk to us, and here she is, so I'm very excited. You're so crazy. So, so, <laughs> so that's our lucky day. So um, anyways, before it looks like everybody has their um, their screen off, that's fine. And you, you're muted, which is great. And if you have any questions, um, I'm sure you will, that please put them in the chat. And hopefully there'll be time for um, Dr. Bhattacharya to answer the questions when we're done. So um if you want to start listing all your degrees <laughs> so everyone knows how brilliant you are, you can take it from here. How's that? Okay. Thank you very much. So welcome to all of you. Today, we're going to be talking about the chronically sick gut. And <clears throat> I'm going to come from a couple of different perspectives. One is from the modern medical perspective, because that's what most people encounter. That's when they um, get sick and they decide, oh, I should go to the doctor. Now, if you've been living in America for a while, you'll know that that's exactly what you shouldn't do because the doctor will make you sicker than you were. That's what I was trained to do is to um, find where you're not sick and make you sick so that you'll come back and see me. That's my allopathic training. But I also have an Ayurvedic degree. And in Ayurveda, we deal with the gut very, very, very well. So when I proposed a few different topics, this was the one that Raka was very excited about. And I'm pretty happy with it because it's a summation of much of the work that I do in, I would say, at least three quarters of my patients. There's something of the gut going on. So this slide is very busy. Uh, this is to remind us that Lakshmi is among us right now in the in the planet on this in the sky and we celebrate Mahalakshmi and uh, Diwali today is called Choti Diwali little Diwali and tomorrow is the main Diwali celebration and so we um, talk to the Davies at this time of year if you'd like to write to me there's my email address right here and I encourage you to write it down if you'd like to get an autographed copy of the book you can send me an email with the subject line of this, uh, you could just write AAW talk and I will know that you were in the audience and I'm happy to, actually this time of year, a lot of people are getting copies for Christmas. So um, I'll send you the instructions on you know what information I need. And you can order that copy of Everyday Ayurveda directly from me by writing to this email address. I also wanna give a shout out to all these different groups that are part of what I do and how I'm able to do it. Um, I am a Fulbright scholar, so I have spent uh, many, many moments, many years actually, in the foothills and mountains and forests of India learning 
about treating the gut and about medicinal formulations that you can't get in this country. Some of them I am, am going to mention, even though we can't get them in America, just so you know they exist, because most of you are Ayurveda counselors, practitioners, or physicians. And some of them, I will warn you, if you can't get them, because there's like all kinds of legalities about certain kinds of medicines. Um, I do direct the Center for Indi for Ayurveda Studies at Indic Academy, and I met Raka through NCAM, the National Consortium of Ayurveda Medicine, where the two of us were slaves uh, to make the conference happen. And we both know the kinds of work we did, but all the skills we gained. My PhD work is from Banaras Hindu University, and I actually live in Banaras part of the year. And Dr. V, if you could just not make... Um, uh, if you could clear the screen of that uh, line that you do, that would be great. Veda Farms is a farm where I do, thank you, uh, where I do medicinal plants work. And I do sit on a committee at the National Cancer Institute where we evaluate all the research that's out there for diseases, mostly cancers. And there's a lot of cancers in the gut, colon cancer, gastric cancers, various um, conditions that happen in the gut area. And we look at all the evidence in the, um, we'll call it the um, non, uh, the cancerous, the gut area, that's like not the outer parts of the body, the inner parts of the body. Uh, and I'm a, on medical faculty at Wild Cornell Medical College. So a shout out to them for supporting me and letting me be a member of their Department of Medicine for all these years, even though I'm not doing mainstream medicine most of the time. This is my private practice. So I do see patients and I put that in there. If any of you does need a consultation and you want to reach out to me, first reach out to someone in your local area if you're in Wisconsin. But if you do want to see me either online or in New York, that's uh, I, I do practice. <laughs> So we're going to talk today about treating the chronically sick gut. And before we talk about being sick, let's talk about being well. There is a force within you, which is referred to as the divine in English, which is kind of a Judeo-Christianic, Judeo Abrahamic religion thing. We talk about gods as being outside of us. But the Hindu philosophy is that the gods are within us. And when we find that god or goddess that is within us that has a particular quality because we can't see that energy we give it a murti and we can look at that murti in the material form so the murti of that which feeds us that which gives us the purest and most um nourishing of the foods that we could take into our specific body in the way that we can digest it that power within us is known as Annapurna. So since we usually begin with mantra as a way of invoking that energy, we'll begin and you can repeat it with me if you like. Annapurne sada purne shamkara pranavallabhe jnana vairagya siddhartam bhiksham dehi ka parvati Mata cha parvati devi pitta devo maheshwara bandhava shiva bhaktascha swadesho bhuvanatrayam. Annapuna is here. You'll see her holding a ladle and having an endless bowl of food. And if you are well, you know what it is to nourish yourself and the others in your life. And so we pray to her to help us as we treat the chronically sick gut to give us the nourishment so our body doesn't fall apart while we are trying to heal ourselves. So let's begin with some Ayurvedic tenets. First is that 80, I could even say 90% of all diseases start in the gut and or the mind. So when our mind is not happy, when our mind is not full of contentment, and is not satiated in what it wants, we can have imbalances. If the gut is not fed properly and is not satiated and cannot digest what it takes in, we can get sick. So it's not that we are what we eat. It's what we are, what we digest. And Ayurveda is really clear that you can take in a lot of food and just not digest it. And it can sit there and rot. And that is not who you are. That rot is what is creating your disease state. Ayurveda also talks that about the fact that food is your main medicine 
as humans, we are taking body form. We have dhatus, which are our tissues, and we must feed them. If we don't feed them, they will decompose. And in fact, the words that we have for the human body, among them are the ideas that we are decomposing our sharira, our kaya, from the day that we are born, the deha, the, the fact that we are on fire and managing water and fire and moving towards a place where we are going to lose our body. Our soul will still be there, but our body will be gone. And so along that path, if we can nourish ourselves with foods, we can uh, give it the medicinal uh, aspects. And so again, we think of the awareness we need to have to choose proper foods and need the grace of what Annapurna gives us, which is that all the food that we put into our mouth and ingest should be nourishing. There are times when you'll get food poisoning, that food wasn't nourishing. There are times when you'll get things called food, but it's really not food. So, um, you know, may we be graced with, with actually having real food. We also need to learn the physiology of the shrotas, the channel, which is about food, which is the Anna food, Vaha, uh, movement across and show this channel. These are loose English mistranslations, but I think most of you have learned about the Annavaha Shrotas. And there are three parts. And I was going to put a little picture of the gut and show you and compare it between the Western medical way of seeing it and the Ayurvedic way of seeing it. But I feel that if you just listen, most of you will already know this. We can go from the mouth to the esophagus, to the stomach, to the uh, small intestine to the large intestine to the rectum to the anus. That's a real quick Western medical way. Annava Shrotas talks about the Amashaya. So you have your mouth up through your esophagus into the first, let's say, two thirds of your stomach. That's like Western anatomy. It's called the Amashaya. The Amashaya is that place where you hold the Amma, where there's undigested food. Shaya means the place of. So the holding place of Amma is the Amashaya. Once it starts digesting, which is in the pylorus of the stomach downwards, so we're talking anatomy of Western medical, pylorus is that kind of cauldron where all the pepsin and the juices are. Once you get down into that area, through the bottom of the stomach into the duodenum, <laughs> so the um, pyloric sphincter down into the duodenum and through the entire part of the small intestine where there's digestion going on is called the pittashaya. And at the end of the pittashaya is basically the end of the anna, anna vahashrotas. After that, you have the appendix and then you have this whole um, ascending, transverse and descending colon and that's called the pakvashaya. But that is part of the purisha vahashrotas. That is not technically anna vahashrotas. So we should put a little line here and just separate it out. So these principal tenets are important for us to think of. But really, to get into treating, we need to think about the symptoms. So when you think about a chronically sick gut for yourself, a family member, a patient of yours, a client, a friend, what symptoms do they have? Ayurveda does not start with blood markers, biomarkers, blood tests and scans and reports. Ayurveda starts with the person in their experience. So what are the symptoms that you are having? So most people who have a chronically sick gut will talk about how they have cramping pain. They have extreme fatigue, especially an hour or so after eating. They have gas. It's either trapped gas, which is called bloating, and it can be the upper belly where they feel a deep sense of discomfort, or it can be the lower belly where they're occasionally passing gas, but it's sitting there. If it's in the lower belly and they're not passing and it's just bloated, that's a sign of trouble. So we generally do not let that continue. We try to help them relieve that gas somehow if they can. There is indigestion. So a person feels like they've eaten a rock and the rock is not uh, digesting. So lack of digestion, indigestion. They have acid reflux sometimes. So this is a chronically sick acid reflux person. Brain fog. Um, sometimes they'll get itching on their outer body <coughs> or itching in their mouth. And sometimes they'll get itching right around their rectum and their anus. And they think that it's like a infection when it's actually a hemorrhoid. And as the hemorrhoid is opening up and food is leaking into the capillaries, there's a sense of um, burning that they think is itching. 
there's all kinds of uh, inflammation going on. And then there's, of course, our all important painful bowel movements. So if you have not seen the Bristol stool scale, which I didn't actually put up here, go online and look up Bristol stool scale. And maybe uh, Raka, you can you can um, post that in the chat so people can find it. So the Bristol stool scale shows you seven different ways that the stool can look. And most people, when I ask them, what does your poop look like? They'll say, I don't look at my poop. I just wipe with toilet paper and I flush. I don't want to see it. Yucky. Well, Ayurveda says that if you don't look at your poop, you don't get the daily news. What happened yesterday in the world comes out in today's newspaper. What happened yesterday in the way you ate comes out in today's toilet. So your daily news is your poop and you should look at it to know how well your body has digested. So <clears throat> usually what happens in these Ayurveda talks is people get started and it's slow and slow and slow. And then they get to the main information that you want, which is how do I treat this? These are the symptoms. How do I treat this? And you see at the very end and the person is talking a mile a minute just to get through everything because they've run out of time. So because I don't like that to happen, <clears throat> I've put the main slide here. If you are able to take a screenshot, take it because this is the culmination, I would say, of a lot of the work that I've done. These are not all the formulations I use, but these are the ones that I felt that if I share with you, they will help you. And so I was debating about um, <clears throat> how to do this because there, I could speak on this one slide for the next you know, five hours with my students. But what I decided is I'm just going to go through a few of them and then go through a few more slides and come back to this. So that'll give you a chance to see these and to ask questions. So <clears throat> in the brown are some of the symptoms that you saw here on this blue slide, which are the symptoms. And so if you have cramps, gas, bloating, I will talk about that first. And then if we come back to it, we'll talk about brain fog and fatigue, indigestion, acid reflux, inflammation, rashes, joint pain, and then the altered bowel movements. So let's talk about this orange column and cramps and gas and bloating, because that's one of the most common things we see. If you go to a regular doctor, an MD, what she will do is say, oh, you have cramps. Again. Let's do a check for whether or not you have H. pylori, because that's probably the cause. If you have bacteria that are creating, they're growing, and so they're creating all this gas, that gas is getting trapped in your stomach, and it's a sign that you have an infection. And so we're going to test you for it. So they'll schedule you <clears throat> for a $950 um, endoscopy. And then they'll take a little biopsy out, which is a little pinch that they just cut out of tissue. And they check to see whether or not it's infested with H. pylori. So <clears throat> if it is, you get, if it's not, you get to come back in six weeks because maybe they didn't do it well, because then they get to make another 950 off you. If they did find it the first time, yay, we found it. You have an H. pylori infection. That is the reason why you have gas and bloating. So we're going to give you these antibiotics. We're going to give you this for life, which is this H2 blocker. We're going to give you these things for immediate relief, like Pepto-Bismol or Tums or some kind of immediate anti-gas uh, kind of uh, um, uh, uh, relief. And then we'll give you H. pylori antibiotics. And the antibiotics will not just kill the H. pylori. They will also kill the gut microbiome that's later downstream but that's just a side effect so don't worry about that because that will happen and then we'll just you know we'll just give you more antibiotics and then you'll be fine and i'm saying this in a sarcastic way but this is exactly how i was taught to treat um this issue of cramps and gas and bloating ayurveda doesn't say that but we'll get to that in a couple of slides here are five things that i think are really great for cramps gas and bloating after or instead of going to the doctor the best remedy that I found <clears throat> is called Gandharva Hastadi Kashayam. Kashayam means decoction, and this is a combination of several herbs. I would recommend that you get it from a company such as AVP, Nagarjuna, um, Vaidyaratnam, one of the South Indian companies that makes it well. And this is a remedy that has some castor oil in it, but its bottom line is that it's going to send things down and out and it's going to clean the gut out of whatever's creating that gas and some of the toxins that are creating the gas as well as some of the putrefaction of stuff sitting in your stomach and your 
um, small intestine that's contributing to that gas and bloating and cramping. And so it's going to send it down. In Sanskrit, that's called vata anulomana. And this Gandharva Hastadi is a kashayam. So it's, I don't think I have any here. It's basically a liquid. It's a dark brown liquid. And you should go to a teacher and learn how to uh, take it for a patient, a specific patient. So there's about three or four variations, but the most common is to take 15 ml of the kashayam, add 15 ml of boiling hot water, mix it, and take it at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. before food. So 20 to 30 minutes before food. And it needs to be taken two or three days, and then they will notice that they will start pooping more. And as they start pooping, their skin will clear up, they'll feel less fatigue, and their cramping, their bloating, their gas will go down. And so this is a really great medicine. I sometimes use it as part of a liver cleanse in the spring and the fall. One of the ingredients, well, actually the main ingredient for vata anulomana is haritaki. So haritaki can come in powders. In the U.S., we can buy single powders. It also comes in a whole bunch of formulations. And one of them is actually castor oil with haritaki. So haritaki is a fruit and it's the pulp of the fruit. And castor oil is the oil that comes from the seed and you combine them together and it makes eranda haritaki. And this is what we use sometimes for promoting bowel movements. So in a chronically sick gut, if the person has enough weight, so they're not super underweight, if they have enough weight, we can give them this eranda haritaki, or we can give them haritaki as a powder, or we can give it to them as part of the Gandharva Hastadi Kachaya. For cramps and bloating, oftentimes we need to focus on eating. So if you haven't learned the 18 different viruddha ahara, which are the incompatible food combinations, go and read about those. And you might find that if you have the American breakfast, which has a glass of orange juice over here and a bowl of cereal with milk over here and some uh, um, some uh, fruit, you know, pineapples and melons and mixed fruit salad here and white bread over here, you may find that those foods are incompatible with each other. And that is part of what's creating a lack of digestion and maybe some um, food just sitting hand hanging out because the body doesn't know how to process it. And that focus on eating will help many people to reduce those symptoms. In Ayurveda, we talk about melting away or digesting away that ama. And so when we melt things away and we cook them, it's called bachana. So when we do bachana, we have um, the cooking of the, the undigested food. And that is generally the first thing that uh, is tried with people who immediately need help. If you have time, you can also do deepana. Deepana is slightly increasing the digestifier slowly and steadily, not all at once, so that the increased fire in the belly will slowly and steadily digest out all the stuff that's creating gas and bloating. And the last thing is to change any foods that are vata. So people that are eating things that are dry, cold, rough, and light are eating vata foods, which then sit in the gut and just do not digest as well and also dry out the gut. And when you dry out the gut, you are contributing to putrefaction and all the, the other uh, problems that happen. So I just went through one of the columns with you. We'll come back to this if we can. Let's, let's back up and really talk about what should happen after you look at the symptoms. So you see all these symptoms here. Uh-oh, how do we put this together? Ayurveda says, look at the etiology and the causes. What modern medicine does is, oh, <clears throat> we're going to name you all the different causes that we theorize are there. Are these evidence-based? Some are, mostly not. But they are um, all these different names. So we have SIBO, we have gut dysbiosis, we have infections like the H. pylori, pylori. we have leaky gut syndrome, which is how the gut is leaky in between the different um, layers. And so you have this permeability problem where things get into the blood system before getting fully digested. You have food sensitivities, which can lead to allergies in the gut or in outside the gut in the body, usually showing up on the skin. You have malnutrition, which is really that you're eating things, but the vitamins are not getting in. The proteins, the macromolecules and micromolecules are not making their way into your, your tissues. 
Um, there are autoimmune conditions. There are inflammatory bowel diseases, which are Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Both of them are called inflammatory bowel. And then you have this catch-all where this, this is not what was diagnosed and that and that and that. And so the diagnosis of exclusion where they can't figure out what's going on and you keep back going back and saying, I have problems. I'm I'm in pain. That diagnosis is called IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. It's not inflammatory bowel disease. It's irritable bowel. And it's not a disease. It's called a syndrome because they don't know how else to put it. So there are all these criteria. You can use the Rome criteria for figuring out whether you're more diarrhea or more constipated and what your patterns are and how, uh, how your mucus state of your poop is and all this. Bottom line is they say it's permanent. <clears throat> they don't know how to treat it. And over the years, I found that if I have a patient that's um, well organized, we can usually get rid of their irritable bowel syndrome in about six to eight weeks, which is a godsend for many people because they've been suffering for years. And most of the Ayurvedic doctors that I know that are good, one of the tests is whether or not they can help people with irritable bowel syndrome to just eliminate it. Um, so there are all these other sequelae or causes, and they say that, well, this is caused by uh, gut problems, or they say, well, this happens along with or causes, you know, cardiovascular disease, liver disease, neurological problems because of the problem in the gut. Ayurveda says, look, is it the seed or the soil? We are going to say, so here's Ayurveda. I should underline this so you understand what this is. So Ayurveda says, let's look at the cause differently. If the Agni is not of high quality, then it's not going to digest. Agni in Sanskrit does not mean fire. Agni means that which transforms. If you don't have the ability to transform what you eat, there's a problem. So what is the quality of Agni in your gut? I know we sometimes say Agni is fire, but since there are so many words in English that you don't translate like coronavirus or you know some of these technical terms, you can also learn just to say Agni. Because that which transforms is about so many things other than fire, right? It's about enzymes, it's about hormones, it's about neurotransmitters, it's about the whole physiology of the gut, the way it's actually working, which frankly, Ayurveda describes a lot better than modern medicine does. It's also about the not just the quality, but the quantity. If you don't have enough Agni, there's a problem. And if you don't have enough Agni, what it's going to lead to is Ama. So... I wanted to connect the Agni to the Ama, but the Ama is undigested food, undigested things that come into your body. I'm not even going to say undigested food, even though that's the usual definition. It's stuff that you eat that's undigestible. If you go to a food container, a, a food product container, what's all that stuff at the end? Maltodextrose, magnesium, stearate, red A and C number four, and you know various things that are to maintain freshness, preservatives, colors, binders, fillers. So <clears throat> those things are not food and they're basically ama. They are not going to get digested because they're not recognized as food. The master agni is called jataragni and that is in your gut. Some people say it's the same as bachika pitta. Jataragni is that pitta that stays in your gut. It doesn't travel around your whole body. It just stays in your gut and its only purpose is to make sure that you can transform, transform food, transform poisons, transform whatever you take into your, your amashai, into your gut. And there's a concept. There's one sentence about it in chapter 15 of the Charaka Chikitsasthan. It's called Viveceti Muncheti. And we could have an entire day-long conference on this, which I would love to. If someone's doing it, please invite me. I would love to sit and listen. Vivek is the word for conscience. Viveceti is that ability for your body to consciously recognize a food and say, yes, this is food. To consciously recognize magnesium stearate and say, this is not food. And to consciously recognize this bacteria and say, this is E. coli, this is poison, we need to neutralize this and not eat it. Or to see, let's say, an unpurified metal like copper and say, oh, they ate a copper flake? What did she eat that for? This is not good. This is going to create problems. This is a poison. So to distinguish between things that can become the human tissue that you are 
and to take it from the gut through into the body, that physiology is vivecheti. Muncheti is the act of separating, what I just did, where I said, this is what it is. Now let's put it here. Let's take it into the body. This is not, let's send that down and out through the, you know, through the colon and out into the poop. So that vivecheti muncheti is an extremely well understood concept by people in Ayurveda and is extremely ignored or, or not even acknowledged in um, modern medicine and by people who practice this kind of aloe Ayurveda kind of thing where they take modern physiology and then assign Indian uh, Ayurvedic words to it. So then there's this concept of seed versus soil, and which is really important in Ayurveda. So modern medicine says, it's the food that you choose. It's the bacteria in your gut. It's the gut microbiome that's making you chronically sick. It's the poisons from whatever foods you ate. It's not your fault. It's not the food that we serve you. It's all about the seed, the thing that goes in, right? So the seed and soil is about here's the soil. And when the seed goes in, it's planted and then the plant grows, right? So some people focus on the seed and some people focus on the soil. If you caught a cold, is it because of that virus that you got? Or is it because your body was not strong enough? Your immunity was not strong enough. And that's why you got sick. Well, statistically, we know that if 10 people are in a room, when someone with a cold walks in, only four or so will get a cold. And this has been done and repeated many, many times. A very, very virulent thing will be maybe like seven or eight, but it will never be 10. And so the question is, if it's about the virus, then how come all the people didn't get sick? Because all of them got the virus in their midst. So Ayurveda says it's not about the virus, it's not about the poison, it's not about the food, it's about the fire in the belly. Ayurveda says it's the fire in the belly that decides the etiology of your illness. So how is your fire? If your fire is not good, you're not going to be able to do well. So the physiology according to Ayurveda is very different from the physiology of modern uh, ways of looking at things. And so... The putrefaction, which I've mentioned about two or three times, is about things coming in. The stomach, the intestine, small intestine and the large intestine are not moving things down and out. And so that food kind of sits there. And as it sits there, think about what happens if you leave a freshly cooked, um, you know, vegetable curry out on the counter in the summer where it's, let's say, 90 degrees in your house or 95 degrees close to body temperature body temperature is 98 point whatever six so let's say you have 95 degree and you leave it out on the counter what's going to happen it's going to rot how long half a day four hours six hours okay leave it overnight come back the next day what will happen put a little glass thing over it open it up so you can watch it and see smell it close it Again, see what happens after two days, three days, four days. That food is going to rot, right? How many of you guys have seen that happen in the refrigerator where it's four degrees, much less on the countertop? So when that happens in your gut and that food starts to rot, the bacteria that were already in there in very small amounts start to eat that food and multiply. And if you didn't put that glass thing over it and it's exposed to the air or there's other bacteria around in that sample of food, it's going to grow. And as it grows, and as the food rots and creates chemicals, the two things, the bacteria growing and the food rotting are going to affect the underlying tissue, which is going to rot and rot more. And that's what's happening in your stomach and your small intestine when you don't send things down and out every day, which is why Ayurvedic people ask you if you poop every day. Modern medicine people don't ask. I was never taught to ask do you poop every day? How is your poop? What does it look like? Here's the Bristol stool scale. How, what does it look like? We didn't care. And the constipation was defined as less than three a week. So three poops a week is not daily because daily would be seven poops a week. So if you're only pooping three days, let's say you poop 3.5 on average, you would be not constipated. Eh, go home, drink some water, eat some spinach and you're fine i'm making donna yawn donna i'm sorry it's so boring for you so if you are 
putrefying your food in your gut, that's a problem. If you don't have downward movement to send it out, that's a problem. If you don't have viveceti munceti going on where your body knows how to recognize food, that's a problem. If you're not regularly cleaning out your gut in two ways, one is eating foods that send things down and out, enough roughage, enough vegetables, enough fluid, but also fasting, not eating when you're not hungry. Maybe having a lighter meal than normal, than you normally do so that your body has extra reserve so it can clean out. Just cleaning out is called shodhana in this case. Understanding the pitta, which is the right amount of water and the right amount of fire that's in the belly. If you drink too much water, that water has to get aligned with the gut in order to become useful. That concept is not in modern thinking, but Ayurvedic people, even culturally Indian people talk about sada. Jal. Sada means, um, how will I say, raw water, right? Water that hasn't been processed so that it is aligned with the energy of the human body. And if you drink that water, you can create a lot of problems in your in your um, system if you don't have good gut fire. So um, these are all physiology concepts. I'll just finish the others quickly. Purisha is poop. Purisha Pariksha is looking at the poop and being able to analyze it. You can use a bristle stool scale or you can use the indices that are used in Ayurveda. And knowing how the poop is is a very big indicator. Upashaya is a word that refers to trial and error. So when you see a patient say that something's working or something's not working, trial and error says, okay, we tried this medicine and it made them worse. Oh, we tried giving them ginger and they started vomiting acid. Wow, that means that they really have so much rotten fire waiting to get out of their stomach that they vomited it out wow okay i tried that that was not a good try that trial and error is called upashaya and it's very common to use that in um, gastric uh, treatment of disease so the next one is apakwa so apakwa is basically it's undigested waste that is sitting there in your gut it's like the predecessor of ama waiting, seeing if you're going to be smart enough to either send it down and out or transform it with some enzymes or some digestive juice. If you don't do it, then you have not mastered that science in your gut and you're going to be in problem. And the last is Vidachana. If you have not yet learned this in your Ayurvedic schooling, get your teacher to teach you. There are four types of Vidachana. We already talked about Anulomana, which is sending things down and out. Shramshana, which is about uh, basically eliminating poisons and just getting things out before you digest them because you don't want to digest them. You just want to get them down and out. Um, whereas Anulomana will usually digest things as you take it out. Bhedana is about breaking. So breaking up hard stool that's very, very dry and rough and sometimes sticking to the side of the intestines. And Rechana is about getting things, just um, scraping them and getting them out. And there are physiologic principles around this. There's also ideal medicines for it. So the ideal medicine for anulomana is haritaki, which we mentioned already. And to find out what each of these uh, medicines are for, for each of these kutki and um, um, trivrit and other medicines, you should just learn one by one what those medicines are and learn how to use them so that you know which type of sending food out you need and some people call vidachana laxatives but it's not really laxative it's just basically sending things out treatment comes in the three that most of you have learned ahara vihara oshadam so ahara is about food and food awareness so the example i gave was don't eat foods that have lots of non-food in them so how fresh is your food when was it last growing on the land attached to the bhumi, whether it's meat or vegetables. When was it last? The amber waves of grain, if you're having grains, you know, the wheat. Um, where did it come from? Was it processed? Today, much of rice is processed. So are you eating processed rice or are you eating real rice? You know, how do you know the relationship you have with rice since it's one of the basic grains? So that food awareness happens. Um, I didn't include this slide that I had meant to, but it's basically a, a slide that shows all the different food groups from chapters five and six of the Ashtanga Hrdayam Sutrasthan. So if you have the Sutrasthan and you can read it, you can go through, and we do this in Vinacharya masterclasses, we go through each food group and what you need to know from the ancient um, times of 
how they understood each food. And each food group has, you know, anywhere between five and 50 examples. And they talk about how to use it medicinally. So once you learn that, it's amazing. You know, when I actually sat down and actually had to learn it to teach a class. And when I learned it, I also added in what happens in modern day. So how is the food processed in modern day? And how do we do recipes in the modern day? And that's been really transformative for me and for my patients because we understand how to use food and there's a different level of awareness. Vihara is about lifestyle. So the first thing is, do you have control over your tongue? So if you see here, you know, what you do with your tongues, you talk to people, are you saying nice things? You eat things maybe you shouldn't eat and maybe your tongue engages in intimacy that is maybe uh, not so selective. We need to have better control over our tongue. And when it comes to the gut, we need to have better control over not just the contagious diseases we get from contact with people, but also what we put into our mouths that then goes down and gets ingested and becomes that either nourishment or the ama. So who makes that choice? That is about your lifestyle. That is about your brain and your heart and your choices. And so controlling and connecting with and altering and counseling the mind is the number one thing we need to do when treating chronically sick gut and the people that are attached to that gut so the mind the mind the mind if there is someone that has cramps bloating and um, actually acid reflux most things the next thing that you should really encourage them to do is go for a walk go out and get exercise go out and do movement i like the word movement more than exercise because you can also do housework you can also do gardening you can do all kinds of movement oriented things it doesn't have to be exercise as in going to the gym or going for a run but it needs to be things that are going to move your body and get your circulation going and so the easiest thing to tell people is go for a 15 minute walk whenever you have a bout of gas bloating after dinner or after lunch go for that walk do the hundred steps which is called shatapadi another reason for many of these symptoms is you don't get enough sleep and you're not getting enough sleep because you're spending time doing all kinds of other stuff which is really optional but you don't think it's optional you don't need to be vacuuming your floors at one o'clock in the morning you need to be sleeping and learning how to manage your schedule and get yourself to sleep and then getting up early, you know, you have to kick that cycle that is dysfunctional and bring it back. And discussing the circadian rhythm is something um, I've talked about in detail and um, everyday Ayurveda and the rituals of it, but also um, many of my lectures that you can find on YouTube, the importance of sleep and getting back on your circadian rhythm. And then electricity fast. So I find these to be really popular with my patients where I tell them you're going to have your last meal before the sun sets. And then after that, you're not going to have any lights on in your house. So right now I've got a whole bunch of lights on because I'm teaching, but I don't usually have, what is this, like six or seven lights on in the apartment um, after sunset. I really let myself just come down and I use a lot less electricity. And I find that fasting from it few nights a week is really great for getting the gut to slow down and do the digestion and not be awake at night. I think most of you that studied Ayurveda know about this. The last section after Ahara Vihara is Oshadam, and those are the formulations, some of which I already mentioned. Um, and then I, I do want to put this in there because I feel like for the gut, it's very important. Some of you know about the myth or the the uh, symbolism of Kamadhenu, the cow who gives us what we need. Turns out as we learn more and more science about the cow, we're learning that there is a bioelectric energy. We're learning that products of the cow are actually very good for human immunity. We're learning that if we circumambulate a cow, there's something that happens in the electromagnetic energy. We're learning that cow urine is among the most cleansing things. So you might have seen that in the mandir in India, they'll take cow urine and they'll sprinkle it around and it's a very good uh, cleanser. Um, people oftentimes use it when they're cleansing a space after a harvest just to, uh, I guess, basically it's an antimicrobial, it's a cleanser and it's a natural organic cleanser. There are so many things that are important about the role of a cow. But there are a couple of foods that are actually very good for the chronically sick gut. Now, if you are vegan, that's a choice. It's a sociopolitical choice for many. 
But there are certain foods that you can't replace. You know, it's like saying, well, I don't want to drink water. Is there another fluid that you could substitute it with? No, there's no other fluid. Water is water. If you don't want to drink water, don't drink it. But then don't ask for the benefits of water that only water can give because it's just water that's water. Same thing with ghee. You cannot make soy ghee and think that it's going to have the same benefits as cow ghee. Same with yogurt that's made from culturing milk to yogurt and then churning it and getting the top part of it off and, and uh, making the butter from that. So that yogurt into that butter, into the ghee, that is crucial actually for our cells, not only of our brain, but of our body, because the physiology of our lipid bilayer, which is the, the, the kind of cell wall or the membrane of the cell is actually most identical to ghee. And so if you give the body ready-made building blocks in here, here's a key, a teaspoon in your, you know, your lunch every day, that is absolutely a healing um, for your body. But you have to be able to tolerate the key. So many people can because they've been building it up for years and many people can't because they've just not learned. So I'm going to go back to the last slide. I know we're at 850, but I'm going to go back to that. Um I just wanted to make the statement because I am quite vocal about it. And someone, an engineer actually criticized me today. He said, well, you're a doctor. You're supposed to be in favor of the medical system. How come you speak out against the medical system? Aren't you kind of a, a traitor? And what I said to him very clearly, because it does resonate very clearly for me, I'm an advocate of the patient. I went to medical school to help patients. I did not go to medical school to become a um, seller of pharmaceutical medicines. And when I got to pathology class and I said, okay, we're learning about the pathology of the cardiovascular system. All we learned were the drugs. We never learned about preventing heart disease, preventing blood pressure, uh, hypertension, preventing anything. We never learned about yoga. We never learned about acupuncture. We never learned about the other remedies that have been used for thousands of years for this pathology. Then we went to the liver and we learned about pharmaceutics for liver. We never learned about the herbal medicines for liver and exercise and various yoga pranayam that you can do to affect the liver. And so as I started asking questions, I found that I didn't want to leave medical school. I wanted to finish what I started, but I didn't find that I had much trust in big pharma because I didn't think it was about healing patients. And I went to learn how to help patients. I wanted to ask the question, how do we heal and find answers to it? And so when I saw these statistics in a, one of these market research reports, I thought it's very relevant to share it with you that a lot of Americans don't trust big pharma because they understand that they're all about profit. And a lot of them don't trust our drug process. So as a pharmacologist trained, you know, with like advanced degrees in pharmacology, I know medicines better than most MD doctors and many of them don't really work. And so what I've had to do is find all these other things that are on the market and available to patients that can actually heal them because I'm more interested in healing patients than I am in towing the party line of what doctors are supposed to be uh, doing as MDs. So in the meanwhile, we have these other things that are coming. Yoga, many people do yoga and find immense benefits for their chronically sick gut. And many people use Ayurveda, which is a growing market. And um, find immense benefits. So we'll go back to the benefits from non-pharmaceuticals. And if you have questions, I see a couple of questions, but please do write them and then we will see how many we can take. So we've covered the things that I would recommend for cramps, gas, and bloating. And these don't always work singularly because there are many other things that need to be done. One of the things we really need to do is get the bowels moving so that putrefaction doesn't happen. And so I very much recommend that Eranda Haritaki, which is here. And I also recommend a combination of two drugs, two uh, herbs that I'm calling drug, but it's actually a dravya. One is an anti-inflammatory that's sometimes used for the joints and sometimes used for the gut. And that's called Musta, Cyperus rotundus is the genus species. Another one is the fruit that is the favorite of Shiva. Um, and you see the bilwa leaves hanging around the temples. 
The fruit itself is called bel in many languages or bilwa is a Sanskrit name. And bilwa is very, very, very good for the gut. It is a it is an anti-inflammatory for the gut, but it takes down that cramping, that bloating. And many, many people will take the fruit from their tree and they will basically crack open the semi-hard shell and take out the pulp and mix a little bit of water with it and drink one of those every day. They're usually ripe in April or May in India. In So I'm thinking like North India in Calcutta. That's where I find them. And it's an absolute soother of the gut in those hot, uh, so India has its uh, summer in March, April, May, like really, really hot. And so Musta and Bill were great. When I get them as powders in America from Gary and Son, Frontier Herbs, Banyu Botanicals, one of these companies that has these herbs, I find that the Musta Bilwa combination is really good. And then I usually add two other things to it. One can be a liver cleanser like Kutki. Kutki is uh, endangered, so I need to mention that. I need to put a little asterisk there. So it's not always available on the market because it is, um, it's an endangered product and it's not supposed to be, uh, well, it was an endangered product, so it wasn't supposed to be exported from India. <clears throat> but there are places growing kutki now in sustainable ways, ecological ways. And so sometimes now you can find kutki. If I find it, I usually buy like a couple of kilos of it and just keep it. So I will add another herb. Sometimes I'll add the haritaki. Sometimes I will add a liver cleanser like uh, bringaraj or bhumi amalaki, which is great for allergies, or thrifala, which is the three fruits. It depends on the patient and it depends on their way that they're having no bowel movements, but chronic low number or unsatisfying bowel movements is a theme for people who have chronically sick gut. Some of them will have diarrhea, 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 or like smudgy, yucky poop, which if you look on the Bristol stool chart, I think it's number six and seven are kind of these semi-farm gooey, um, it looks, it's just like pudding, basically, brown pudding. And sorry about that. And so uh, these kind of like non-optimal poops are a big problem. Let's move over to the pink row where it's column, which is brain and brain fog and fatigue. This is about people who are eating foods that they can't digest, which are not going out of their body and are not getting digested. And it's basically building up as garbage in their body. And Modern medicine doesn't tell you anything about this, but Ayurveda is really clear that you need to get that out of you. So again, the bowel movements, get things flowing, get the haritaki and get some trifala. If you're, you know, if you've got a little bit of a problem, trifala is good. But for most of these people with chronically sick gut, trifala is not going to do anything for them. You're going to need that air and the haritaki. You're going to need trifritleyam and some of these advanced medicines that you need to really learn about before you prescribe them. And you're going to need to give them things that are um, going to step them in the right direction. These are not curative, but these are for uh, phase one. And one of the reasons I'm not telling you some of the others is because you really have to work with someone, an apprentice, to learn how to do this. This is not stuff that you should just do over the counter. And I know that many of you are um, laypersons. And so it's important that you don't just go out there and just order the medicine and take it yourself. It's important you work with someone. But here are some of the things you can do. Start having rice porridge where you go from munda, which is basically boiling the rice and having a lot of fluid above it, like eight times the volume of fluid and just drinking that fluid and leaving the rice for someone else to eat. That's very, very, very starchy, non-solid to where you've got a little bit of rice in there, but mostly starch, that's called peya. So if you eat only that, it'll be boring. You won't get your kick, your flavor, your spice, your, you know, your sour and all your six tastes, but it will nourish you and it will be very easy to, for your gut to digest and it will start to heal and have a little reserve to push some of that undigested stuff down and out. A lot of people who have grief cry a lot, cry around meals. They absolutely have bad gut fire. So resolve the trauma, do that work and find that as they do the work, they'll say, you know, I feel hungry. 
because a body starts resolving and sending things down and out that it's been hanging on to. Raise your gut fire. If you don't have acid reflux, ginger, fresh ginger, pulverized, a little bit of uh, lemon juice and a little bit of black salt. Black salt is the one with the minerals in it. Some trikatu, which is a three pungents. Some dashmul. These are all herbs that you can use to help people to increase the fire in their gut. Sleep at night. We talked about this a little bit. Get yourself back on your circadian rhythm and your gut fire, your clock genes of your gut and your stomach will come up. Clock genes for the liver are at 2 to 4 p.m. That means you should have your biggest meal before that 2 p.m. time point. So if you're not having your biggest meal between 11.30 and 1.30, then what are your liver clock genes doing? They're like twiddling their thumbs of, okay, she's not eating very much. What are we going to digest? Okay, our time point is from 2 to 4 p.m. What proteins are we going to create? Clock genes are a really important part and reasoning of why we need to get our factory of our body from morning sunrise to sunset in a particular order so that our organs can do their jobs the way a factory does. And then stop ingesting non-foods. Just stop eating those things that have no nutritional value in them. And you will find that a lot of that gunk that builds up, you know, I, I don't want to name names, but corn chips <laughs> and uh, most of the cold, cold uh, carbonated soda drinks and, um, you know, donuts that don't have much value in them, any food value in them, um, things that seem yummy because you grew up with them, but have really no nutritional value. Pizzas that are made from old dough that was kept in the freezer that have no prana in them and canned tomatoes and canned corn and canned uh, old meats that were, you know, li live animals years ago that are now being put on your pizza and baked and microwaved and then sent to you. Um, these kind of foods are non-foods. Stop eating them. So how do we get people to stop eating them? We start crowding them with healthy options so that these are not their top options of the day. And when they have soups that will fill the gut, mung, mung bean is... um. Mung is green gram or yellow gram, making soups of that and substituting that for other soups, making sauces from mung rather than making them from the tomatoes and other uh, frozen vegetables. These kind of cooking options are really important. And one of the cookbooks that I love, I'm not going to reach for it, is What to Eat for How You Feel by Divya Alter, who actually went through her own gastric problems and uh, started cooking for herself and found herself transform. So it's nine o'clock now. And I will uh, pause for a moment for Raka and find out what do you want me to do? Do you want me to finish these last three columns or should we stop here and uh, take a break or uh, Raka or Susan, one of you guys want to chime in? Susan, what do you think? Um, I could listen to you talk all night, to be perfectly honest. So I don't know if I'm a, a good person. I just, um, as someone who has gut problems, I'm just, you know, and an Ayurvedic practitioner and studying with Divya, I still learn so much from you. So, okay. um, yeah, I know that some so, questions had popped up. Yeah, and I see the questions. So, uh, thanks to Raka for putting the Bristol stool scale in the chat. So most of you can see. There's a little thing on the side, which is type one to seven, and you can just see it. Just know that the one in the middle, type four, it's like the dhatus, right? It goes one to seven, but the number four is the key one. So that's the healthy one. So take a look at that. And um, I'll just go through these. I know most of the people here. Kimberly, hi. So Charaka, uh, Chikitsastan, it's 15. It's a chapter called Grahani. And there's a line I can uh, maybe reach up and get my book. Um, it's the chapter on Grahani and there's a statement about the Vivecheti Muncheti, but you cannot see it in Charaka. You need to go to the Sanskrit commentary texts uh, where you'll learn about the actual depth of the concept. And that should be, you can usually find like Dr. Gigi, if you're still studying with him, Gigi Nair can explain it to you in more detail. Next one was Raka answering, 15th chapter elaborates on. So there's your answer. Um, MG asked, what companies from South India do you recommend? So AVP was one of them. And another was uh, Nagarjuna. So I'll type that in. Nagarjuna. Oops. 
Nagarjuna. And another one is um, Vaidya Ratnam. Vaidya Ratnam. And another one, another one that's really good. They have the best machinery. They do it really well, but you can't get it here unless you talk to me. <laughs> um, but it's called Ashiwad, and that's also out of Coimbatore. Um, what's another one? AVN is another one. Are you Vaidya AVN? There are some of the names, and they are the ones that I look to. I also tend to go to places like distacart.com and A to Z Indian products. Got to spell it right. Dot com. You can try these websites. They usually have Indian um, groceries and things, and among them, they have the dietary supplements, which we call Ayurvedic medicines. So those are really great. Um, Josephine asks, oh, wait, I lost my space here. Um, okay, well, I'm just going to continue where I am, then we'll come back. Uh, Josephine asks, would you recommend Ajwine instead for getting up Agni up? And I would never recommend it for anyone that's had acid reflux. I would recommend it for people who have gas and bloating as a trial, as an upashaya. But a lot of people react to Ajwine. They, it's just too heating for them and they cannot handle it. And for people who have what's called a weak gut or a um, it, it kind of you'll say like it's a brittle but weak gut, Ajwine doesn't do well for them because they don't have good fire and their tissues are kind of assaulted. So the heat makes them even more... Um, they make them weep basically. And the people just have a lot of crampy pain. So I don't recommend Ajwine to everyone. I recommend it to people who are pretty strong. I recommend it to people who are athletes who have occasional acid reflux. The other thing is you want to make sure that the person isn't on medications that could be causing it. Because many medications, medications that are pills are what? They're ushna, right? Because they're salts. So most pharmaceutical medicines are salts and salts are heating. And they are... Uh, Ruksha, because they are salts, and so they're drying. And so when you're introducing pharmaceutical medicines into people, you're introducing Ruksha and Ushna, Ruksha and Ushna, and they're doing it three times a day, and they're taking 20 pills, and then you're wondering why that Ruksha Ushna is making them so sick, and that is um, part of the problem. So uh, let's see. Let's go to the next question. Um, does the book have recommendations for getting of PPIs. Anita, can you please um, elaborate on what what mm -hmm. you are asking about? I'd like to know what would be the way to get off it, you know. Uh, I've get been... off of PPIs. Okay. Yes, yes. Well, it's to build up your gut fire. It's it's what we've been talking about. So once you okay. get once you get your gut fire up, the problem is that, you know, what it's doing is it's uh, suppressing clay the cacafa. It's suppressing the antacid that you naturally make. Right. Because it's messing up the whole balance in your gut of all the hormones. And so you really have to work with someone who knows how to get your gut fire up and also clean out all the ashes. Like the, you know, in a campfire, when you have ashes at the bottom of the fire and then you put more wood on and you just make a new fire, you can only do that once or twice or three times. After that, the ashes that are all over the campfire are going to prohibit good fire from building up. And that's kind of what happens in your gut when you have all this ama sitting there. It's like ashes that are just littering everything. So you need to get that cleared out. And the way to get it cleared out is something that each person, you know, different individually, right? Depending on how long it's been going on, what you have going on. So yeah, um, Kimberly had a, so I'll go to the next question if that's okay, Anita. Yes, thank you. Uh, Kimberly had another question. Uh, what was the herb she mentioned before? Bhumi Amalaki. I honestly can't remember, but I yeah. think I mentioned Bringaraj, Kutki. Um, uh, if anyone else remembers, I know, I know I mentioned Haritaki. There's a whole bunch of liver herbs and you can go and find, you know, yeah. one of the great ways to learn liver herbs is to go and see what American formulations do. They put everything together. They figure if one thing is good, we'll just put everything in there and then something will work and then it'll be fine, which is actually not the correct way to do it. But anyway, so you see all these things called liver support, liver cleanse, liver this. Just go and see all the different herbs they have in there and that'll give you the things that work on liver. And then you can look through each one, learn the rasa panchaka. Rasa panchaka means it's rasa, virya, 
vipaka, uh, sorry, guna and prabhava. So the karma of how it works. And then you can figure out for this patient, what do I need? So Bhumi Yamalaki is really good for people who have allergies. I find that when you clean out the liver, the eosinophils go down, but also it's not just about the eosinophils because that's a, a lab marker. It's about how the person feels. They feel less itchy. They have less clogged up situses. So they are healing as their blood is getting cleared out and their sinuses, you know, all the stuff in their sinuses is getting cleared out. Um, but I honestly cannot remember. I think we're recording. So maybe you can ask Raka later uh, to find out when I was talking about that, which other herb. Raka, did you take notes when I was saying it? She she answered it right after I asked it. You Is it Bringaraj? Yeah. Was Bringaraj actually? Okay, I, good. I think so. I'm, I mean, I'm not sure if I... No, remember. I think you're right. I think you're right. Okay. Yeah. I, I mentioned Bringaraj because it's one of them, but I also know there's a bunch of others that I love, you know, and I... Um, I find that if they have stuff going on in their pelvis, I love Anantamul, Sariva. Um, if I find that they have stuff going on in their liver, but there's a lot of stuff in their lungs, I love Pushkarmul. Pushkarmul is one of my go-tos for liver stuff. I like it even more than Vasa because Vasa, it turns out its properties depend on where it was grown. And in the U.S., we don't even write where things are sourced from, really. You know, we don't say where they're grown. We kind of take it that the company that bought it markets it here stores it there puts it out here and there's all kinds of lying and cheating that goes on um, around herbs because they don't value the the bhumi that it's grown on as one of the factors of how it works on the human body what do you so, think of guduchi i like guduchi i like guduchi a lot but you have to get a good source of it okay. i find the Aryan sun has the best that i have found um, and it has to have that right smell. If it doesn't have the right smell, then who knows what it is, where they got it from. And do you know that the chemicals that are in guduchi vary based on what it's growing on? So guduchi that grows on a neem tree is different from guduchi that grows on a people tree. Mm. So if you want to have the most cleansing and good for your immune system, then the neem tree guduchi is what you want. And there's a guy that's actually done the work to look at the chemicals that are made by the guduchi plant when it grows on a neem tree there's a there's a synergism right there's an interaction that happens in that ecosystem and so until people are smart enough to start labeling the guduchi i don't know what i'm getting right so um yeah so that's like a big concern because the people that are trying to sell herbs just want to make profit these days they're not really concerned about really good guduchi hmm. That's what I have to say. Plus, you know, there was that report about some hepatologists that tried to say that their patient got liver failure because of Guduchi. Remember that? No. Yeah. So there was a whole report out about that. It was just, there's a lot of drama basically to shut down uh, Guduchi because they saw that it was working so well. Wow. So in India, it was a big, it was a big thing. So yeah. So let's go on to the next question. Also by Kimberly. Kimberly has just posted in a bunch of questions here. Um, Kimberly. Yeah. So you come to master classes again. So the uh, what's the next one? What are clock genes? Are clock so genes? I, th yeah, I think Raka gave you a good article that you can access. And I will encourage all of you guys to go and do some reading there. The best articles that I've seen for lay persons who are not into all of the the um, technical stuff is from Scientific American. They had a really nice review of clock genes. Um, but Raka has put a pretty good one in here. And it's, um, you know, it's a, let me just see how old this is. I know this article. It's from BMJ 1998. So there's a lot that's come out since then. And the guy is famous for it because he's won the three that got the Nobel Prize on clock genes back in 2017. But I would, sorry, Raka, but I would read the article she gave you and then find another one that's more recent because there's a lot of stuff that's come out about clock genes. Um, the next question is, let's see. I'm looking for someone that keeps sending me private messages. Um, if you guys want to write to me, then some of you are asking, I have a bunch of private messages. So I'm just going to put this in the regular chat instead of to each of you individually. Um, so you can write to this email address if you have specific consultation questions. So Susan's question just came up. Okay, let me go back to... 
Okay, Malaya, one of my students says, please continue this chart. I'll do that. Food compatibility reference, please. So Priti, food compatibility is about incompatibility. It's called Viruddha, Viruddha, Ahara. And these are 18 different types of incompatibility. So the easiest one for Americans to understand is the kosher rule of not mixing milk with meat, right? So that's a no-no. And they do it because they say it's a kosher rule, but it's actually a food incompatibility because the way that we digest one is different from the way that we digest the other. And there are proteins in dairy milk and there are, uh, especially, you know, there are eight kinds of milk, but I'm when I say milk, I'm thinking about cow milk. And then different meats are proteins and they have a different way of being digested and the body gets confused. Think of a very low competency secretary who's Xeroxing something and then you ask her to um, print something out or send a fax and she just gets completely discombobulated because she doesn't know how, I'm saying she, it could be a he, who doesn't know how to do two things at once or four things at once. And so that is an example of incompatibility of the gut. The gut's like, wait, I was trying to digest this piece of chicken and now you put this cream sauce on it. Now I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm being kind of a caricature, but this is really how the gut that is chronically sick works, right? And if you're healthy, you can do it, but then as you get, you know, if you get unhealthy, you're not exercising enough, you're not eating the right foods, you're eating too many preservatives, you're not resting enough, your sleep is not good, then you'll find that those are those moments where your vulnerability is there and then you will stop uh, digesting foods properly and then you'll have that buildup of ama, and then you go down that slippery slope toward chronic gut disease. And that is not a good thing. You can bring yourself back, but it's not easy. Um, so let's go back to the questions. Continue the chart, continue the chart. Okay. Next is what about anise for digestion? So I don't find anise to be good for everyone. I find it's also kind of too pungent for me. I can't suck on anise. It just makes me a little bit crazy. It's a little too close to licorice and some of these pungent sweets. So I don't find it to be pleasant. What I find to be really easy for people is a combination of toasted cumin plus fennel seeds combined together with a little bit of those self-forming rock salt, or oh, sorry, uh, um, how do you call them? Rock sugar. Um, that are usually in like a cube form, those are together a really good combination as a digestive with a little bit less of the rock sugar and a little bit more of the fennel and some cumin. That really works well. And uh, wow, you guys are answering questions for each other. This is really good. So Gary and Son is Gary. If someone can find the website, I think it's GarySon.com. Is that right? Someone check that for me. Um, or is it Gary Inson? I don't know. But Gary and Son is located in Reno, Nevada, and he has some of the yes, it's GarySon.com. So I've answered that one. And thank you, Raka, for writing about the book. And what was the one good for allergies? Thank you, Kimberly. And it looks like we have answered all the questions. Great. I will say that Sandeep Agarwal has been sourcing ingredients from all over India. I've actually met him in India while he's going around sourcing things. He used to just make ghee. So when I first met him, I called him Ghee because he is really good at ghee. And then he decided to start making ghees with dravya in them. So those are called gritams. And then from getting sources of guruchi and brahmi and all the different keys he makes, he started sourcing other items. And I find that Pure Indian Foods has really good saffron. They get really good. Uh, just go to their website, pureindianfoods.com, and you'll see that there's a lot of really high quality, um, you know, lacodong turmeric and various things that you're not going to find in most places. And you can also write to Sandeep. He is a student at Dinacharya. So if you're in class, you can just, you know, private message him, but you can write to him and ask him for specific ingredients. And if he doesn't already have them on the way, he can help you source them. So, yeah. So there you go. Sandeep has just put his um, email in there. And I'm not doing it because, you know, he's my student. I'm doing it because I've really checked out his, as I do with all the websites. I don't recommend websites unless I've checked them out. Um, and And in saying that, some of you guys know that I'm critical. I will tell you that anyone that makes a formulation of herbs 
and uses extracts and puts a lot of those preservatives in them, preservatives in them, I do not recommend them. I just don't. People come to me with all kinds of samples and stuff. And I say, oh, is this herb or is this extract? Oh, it's extract and it's pure and it's pure extract and it's 40% this and it's standardized to this. That is not what Ayurveda is talking about. Ayurveda is talking about the entire prana of that plant, even if it's dry. And there are some exceptions. And yes, there are concerns about the way things are picked, adulterations and contaminations. If the fields are near an airport, when the plane lands, the fuelage gives off cadmium. That is where the cadmium is coming from. I think I think some of you know it. Most of you have not learned this. Um, cadmium is not part of Ayurvedic formulations. So there it is. Um, what's your take on biologics for Crohn's? So which biologics, Diana? Diana can't talk. She's got herself on mute. She's probably at a party right now, Saturday night, listening in on Ayurveda because she loves Ayurveda and she loves her parties. Okay, Diana, you can, um, I don't know what Stellara is. So what I'm going to do instead, since I don't know what that is, is I'm going to welcome, I think it's a monoclonal antibody thing, right? It's like a biologic. Um, Hi, sorry. I, this is my party right here so yeah here's chewy i know chewy's not here he sends okay. his love okay. but so it's yeah. an immunosuppressive right isn't it one right. of those um like cyclosporin kind of monoclonal antibody things yes so what so, do i do yeah like what do you think about getting off of those like how to like if somebody has been told that they need to go on for an emergency you know for a the severe Crohn's and then they want to get off of it. You know, what is, what is that like? Yeah. So I have a lot of patients who are on um, medicines for Crohn's and also ulcerative colitis, and they just need to work with someone who is going to slowly get them to stop being so inflamed in their bottom of their, you know, gut, right there. It's usually their lower colon and um, many people are resistant. I will say, this is a professional meeting, so I'll say this here. I don't like working with ulcerative colitis patients because most of them are really mean. They are angry and they are mean. And they are mean and they are, I can't use the B word, but they're mean. And so I don't like working with them. Um, I find them to be really in need of psychological uh, maturity and I think a lot of it is actually because their microbiome is so off and they just do not have emotional maturity and control like over themselves. And so they lash out at everyone and their doctors, you know, the, the person in front of them, they're going to lash out. So I see people once or twice. And if they're mean, which has been hundred percent of the time, I send them to someone else. I don't even want to deal with people that have inflammatory bowel disease because I just find them to be mean. That's where I'm at with that. Um, and I'm saying it as a doctor. Luckily, I'm not a gastroenterologist, so I don't have to deal with it. But I do have a lot of friends who are gastroenterologists, and they talk about their patients in very derogatory, awful ways because they're so traumatized from these patients. So I think um, Ayurveda does have ways of helping soothe them, but I think it has to be done in a way that we can actually help the patient before they harm themselves. And a lot of them do harm themselves because they're so mean <laughs> so yeah then you can talk to me more about this later if you like um but we do wean people off of these drugs if we can because they're immunosuppressive and they're not good for the person long term no one should be suppressing their immune system long term it's just not good for uh good for their long-term health you know i think it lowers life expectancy so we're going to um, move to some of these other recommendations uh, since so many of you guys want to see the rest of it. So we did the, the Mavro, which is, you know, uh, about brain fog. Indigestion is a big problem. And I didn't write this, but the first thing that I should have put up here is don't eat so much. There are a lot of people that have indigestion because they're chronically overeating. You know, I just have to finish everything on my plate. Oh, this lasagna is so good. I just, oh, I just want a second piece. Oh, I was done eating and then they offered me dessert. Ati bhojana. You've eaten and then before you fully digested it, 
you've like partly digested and then you eat on top of it. And then someone gives you something else and then you have your, you know, after dinner drink and then you have another dessert and you're up to here. And that is chronically over time going to douse the fire and create Agni Mandia. Agni Mandia is low digestive fire and it is in Ayurveda. It's the main reason why people have um, this uh, this problem of indigestion. So that's what that's a, a big central core that you need to work with. In addition to that, they've got stuff that's not digested. So ama pachana, take the ama, the undigested goop, and get it cooked out, right? So how do you cook it? You've got to be really careful, but sometimes the ginger with the lemon juice, with the black salt mixed together, marinated, eaten 10, 15 minutes before the meal. Sometimes that's just enough punching up of the uh, gut fire before they take their meal and make sure the meal is light. I usually start with a soup. I don't start with salad. I start with a soup. I have them eat a main meal that is not full of more than one grain and not more than one meat if they're eating meat. And I don't give them all the different vegetables. I tend to go with gourds because they're considered to be among the most healing. In fact, um, patola, do you guys know what patola is? Uh, let's see, what are some of the other words? Parival is the Hindi word or potol is the Bengali word. I don't know all the different languages you guys speak, but patola is considered to be one of the most healing vegetables for the gut, for indigestion. So put that in the diet, have them have it, you know, two to three times a week. There's a lot of different recipes for patola. And that tends to be, you know, a way to teach them. Vegetables each have medicinal properties and you will find them in this Ashtanga Hridayam. Uh, Sutra Stam. By the way, I just got some copies of this in. I have 10 copies of each, volume one and volume two. So if you're interested, write to me. Um, and you can't get this book in America. I can't find it anywhere on Amazon or anything. So uh, anyway, I got them. So if you go to this book, chapter six, and you go into about the fifth or sixth section in from about Shloka 70 something, it's called Shaka Varga. Shaka means those things which grow on the arms or of trees, which are the fruits of the trees, right? Which we call vegetables. The vegetables are ranked and they have different medicinal properties. And so you should introduce those into people's diets. However, plants for the most part are um, made to be indigestible to people because they don't want cows to walk by and just eat them. They want to be able to make seed and make a new generation and so most plants most vegetables will have a little bit of something that's toxic or poisonous to animals to basically prevent us from eating them and eating them raw and that is why humans have learned to cook vegetables before we eat them but nonetheless they're generally not the most nutritious um, easy thing to eat. And so Ayurveda doesn't say you should eat a lot of vegetables. Ayurveda says you should have, this is for the chronically sick gut. You should have just those vegetables that are going to help heal the gut. And that does not include potatoes and heavy root vegetables. They are the gourds and they are the, um, the vegetables that are, um, fruits, you know, the fruits means the you guys know botanically fruit is not the same as a veg, right? A vegetable. So the fruit of the plant. And it says that what you should be eating are the grains that you grew up on. So if you grew up in most parts of the world, um, we'll let's say rice and wheat. For some of you, it's oat. For some of you, it's maize or corn or quinoa. And if you grew up on a particular grain, go to that grain in the most pure form, right? Don't start experimenting oh well what do you think of millets it's the international year of millets listen if you grow grew up on foxtail millets or kodo millets or one of the millets fine but most of you didn't you didn't grow up on a farm in karnataka so don't be eating millets as your go-to millets this international year of millets when the someone interviewed me and asked me i said international year of millets is perfect for increasing the patient base of Ayurvedic physicians because people eat too much millets they're going to get sick they're going to become part of the chronically sick gut crowd and we're going to have more patients so that's the best thing I can say about millets don't eat too many millets um, what is good then if you're trying to heal the grain that you grew up with and they say 
barley. Barley is one of the safe grains that is very, very easy to digest if you can't get access to rice, uh, real rice, or whole, unbleached, unbroken, unenriched wheat flour. You can get that. You can go to farmer's markets and get it. I have some sources here in New Jersey where near my farm, there is a place that actually has um, pure whole wheat that's not bleached and all that fortified and all that. Um, but that's, you know, you should find that and then mill your own flour, get the wheat berries, mill your own flour. So, okay, that's uh, Amapachana. The next medicine is hing vashtaka. So ashtaka means eight. Hing is the first. And so hing vashtaka is hing plus eight different herbs. And these are all digestive herbs. So people oftentimes keep hing vashtaka. They'll take either as a tablet or as a um, powder and they will, um, they will, hang on one second. I have a patient downstairs. <laughs> um, one second i have to i guess it's past oh it's past time that's why uh so hing vashtak is something that many people use but you have to know when to take it hing is a tough substance for some people and what i found clinically is one in 12 actually vomit at the smell of hing how many of you hate the smell of hing asafoetida hing Okay, so I have met a person that literally smells it and vomits. So you don't want to be that person and then go buy, you know, a, a case of Hingwashtuk. So you want to check it out as a, as, a, as a practitioner before you give it to your patients. You want to give them a sample and check it out. Okay, so um, acid reflux. This is really important. The biggest cause that I have found for acid reflux is taking pharmaceutical medicines, that Ushna and Ruksha. The second big, big, biggest cause I found is overeating chronically, just filling your gut, overeating chronically. And it's not because they're obese, it's because they overeat that the fire goes down and then it can't digest. And then that food builds up, doesn't go out through the poop, stays in the body and then gets built up onto the fat reservoirs on the body. Ayurveda does, the smart Ayurveda people, call obesity as malnutrition because you're not getting the food digested and taken across as a building block for your tissues. You're basically taking it and just throwing it into the body and just storing it like you store old newspapers in your garage. And so um, obesity and overeating and all of these things, a lot of the people have acid reflux. So what I love is the marine calcium, the bioactive calcium. So shank is the, you know, the conch shell that you blow. Shanka, when you take it and you pulverize it and then you bake it, that's called basma. So it's an ash and shanka basma is uh, one of the great things to use. There's also kamduga. This is the one without all of the metallic and herbal minerals. And that is a wonderful uh, medicine if you can get it. There are some marine animals which are now endangered. So I should actually put a little star there. And you don't want to get one of those because it's actually illegal to import them. But um, in India, they have a sustainable supply. So even though they can't export them, Kamduda is a wonderful medicine. I actually have some that I got years ago because it doesn't go bad. And it's wonderful. You just take one tablet and just sucks up that acid, uh, the acidic uh, reflux. So I'll give patients like five at a time and see if it takes care of them. In the emergency moment of acid reflux, before they go for the Tums or the Zantac or whatever they're going to take, I oftentimes like, tell them, do you have some yogurt at home? That's not the fruit on the top and not the flavored ones. Take, and it has to be home plated. It has to be made at home where you make it and then you take milk and then you make it again and then you take milk and you make more. So that's called plating yogurt. So if you make yogurt at home, it has a very healing quality because there's no preservatives in it. And after like two or three um, cereal batches, it's very clean and it's very medicinal. And if you just have a tablespoon of that yogurt, it's something called abishyandi. Abishyandi means it clogs the channel. So it clogs the acid reflux from getting out and going upward. And so you don't get that 
uh, esophageal burning. And people find that that curd, curd means yogurt, by the way, will will um, dampen that. If you take it and you make fresh butter, I don't know how many of you guys know about making fresh butter, but fresh butter is one of the really nice cures for acid reflux. But you cannot just go to the store and say, well, I bought it yesterday. When you bought it, you know, it was already made a long time ago. It has to be fresh butter made in the last 24 hours. Mint, pudina is the Sanskrit word. Pudina is really great. There's actually a medicine called pudinhara. So it means to get rid of your acid reflux, you just take this. It's very, very strong. It's like having a mint drop. And um, have any of you been to Vichy in France? There's a town that makes these peppermint drops that are amazingly medicinal. <laughs> so you can buy them in Paris, but they're called Vichy drops and they are incredibly strong for people that have acid reflux. It's that mint that is, that is uh, intensely cooling and it'll cool down that pitta that's creating the acid reflux. Uh, temptation, eating less. So the word for temptation in Sanskrit is moha. So eat less. That's hard for many people. You know, it goes back to that slide where I showed the control over the tongue. And then uh, the last one is mukta. So mukta is pearl. It's a little bit expensive, but it really works well. You take pearls, usually the ones that are like the shavings off the, you know, the pearls that they're making into earrings. So they'll they'll shave off something that's not perfectly round and they'll save those shavings and they sell them to Ayurvedic doctors who take the little grindings and they um, they they pulverize them into micro particles. And then those are fed to people and pearls are deeply cooling. In fact, if you happen to be a pitta like me and you wear pearls, you'll find that pearl strand, they have to be real pearls, not these like fake ones, but real pearls will actually cool down the body. So the kings who were, you know, these grand big egos come back from war, a lot of pitta energy, their wives would bring them and, you know, their pearls and they would wear their pearls. So many of my patients who are very overheated, I tell them under your shirt, wear a string of pearls and men do it. And I've seen everything from uh, blood pressure coming down to acid reflux being resolved. Okay. The last one, and then we'll finish. Um, I'm sorry that this is so long. Uh, if you need to go, you can go ahead and then Raka will get you the recording. So, Proval is coral. It is illegal to export this because of the great coral barrier reef being, you know, destroyed. So I put a little asterisk, so it's not easy to bring it in. But if you can get Proval Panch Amrit, this is a formulation. I actually just brought some in from my friend who was in India and came to the NCAM conference. Um, it's just really great. It's excellent for inflammation in the gut and for um, all kinds of issues with the bones, like joint issues, but it's really great for inflammation in the gut. I use it for a few different purposes. I also use it for bone cancers. I use it for people after chemotherapy. Um, I think many of you know that I do see patients in the cancer care spectrum, but I do uh, love Proval Panjamrit because it rebuilds the gut and it rebuilds bone. And I use it for osteoporosis patients too. And I use it for people after they've had fractures and fallen because it just, it somehow resets the calcium metabolism in the body. Um, if you want to replace the bone and you do not want to have uh, stuff that's illegal because, you know, it's endangered species, you can use the chicken, kukut, shell, anda, uh, sorry, I guess you'd say egg, and then tuak is the shell. So kukut under tuak is the chicken egg shell, which we get in the grocery store. Take the egg out, save the shell, wash it, let it dry, and then crush it and pulverize it in like a mortar and pestle or in a grinder and then bake it. And it'll come out as very, very fine powder and then have, you know, half a teaspoon of that every day. And, and have it as a source of bioactive calcium. So if you, so my patient said to me, well, if I don't want to do all that work, can I just buy it? So I gave her a link at Distacart. Distacart does sell kukudanda dwak basma, and I use it for people with um, uh, osteoporosis. But in her case, I also use it for inflammation in her gut. And she has some joint pain as well. Now, when you have 
chronically sick gut uh, with joint pain, it is not about the gut only. It's about stuff from the gut leaking through the gut and finding a secret place where it can deposit, which ends up being your joints. And that is a pathology that needs to be dealt with um, differently. So the kukudanda, what it does is it cools the area of the gut so the leaky gut can heal. And that's, I think, basically what it's doing. Um, but it's not the only solution. You need to be doing other stuff to reduce that inflammation, you know, whether it's one of these other um, issues that's going on. Arogya Vardhini is a basma. It does have the illegal metals in it. I do not suggest any of you take it unless you know what you're doing or unless you have me as your doctor um, because most people can't prescribe it. And it is uh, very common in India to use, but it's not so common here. It's a fantastic liver cleanser. It's a fantastic way of getting rid of inflammation in the gut. I've used it for people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I've used it with people who have hepatitis, all kinds of liver problems and gut problems, chronic gut sickness with liver manifestations. Um, so I mentioned it because it just really is a great medicine and I've used it for a, a whole variety of um, things. You know, I use it for bone spurs. I use it for all kinds of stuff where liver metabolism and calcium metabolism are off. Amapachaka churna is stuff of herbs only. And I don't think there are any minerals in there. And it basically cooks the ama. So there's a churna that you can buy. Just go to Distacart and you'll see amapachaka churna. Um, and then the last one for inflammation is flame is the word in inflammation. You want to cool down that flame. You want to reduce the heat inside the gut. So a really great way to do that is using sandalwood, which is called chandan. And chandan fermented into this liquid is called chandan asava so i take 15 ml of that put in boiled water that is cooled to room temperature 15 ml of that and then drink it and i find that that really reduces chronic inflammation in the gut so i've gone through i don't know how many that is maybe like 20 25 different um things that i do and I hope that that's been useful for you because I find that most of the talks on the chronically sick gut really focus just on um, symptoms. And then they'll say, you know, take some thrifala and maybe they'll have like a slide like this that's kind of very um, general. But I want to make sure that you had some specific things. So I hope that was helpful. And I think with that, we should finish and then let you guys get on with your evening. Well, I can't speak for everyone else, but I just found this incredibly interesting and I loved it. And I hope you come back and talk again to, for us, with us, uh, whatever. I would love it. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste to all of you. Namaste. Thank you, Dr. Baswati. Jai Ma.